Professor Tanya Mitrovic. And it's a very interesting topic where you say when, when she's where she can tell you in more detail basically how you use video to teach presentation skills. So something like well, she's the expert here, so let's listen to her. Uh, uh, please listen attentively and of course make sure you have questions ready at the end of the sessions. We also have lecturers, it's uh, open for you all as well for questions. Passing on to Prof. Tanya. So this talk is very different from the one I gave this morning. This is about video-based learning and that's a project we have started uh, two years ago. Um, and the other collaborators, Vani Kritrov and Lydia Lau, they are from the University of Leeds in UK. Amali is another one of my ex-students. She's at the University of Adelaide in Australia. And Moffat Matthews is my colleague from the same university, University of Cambridge. So that's the thing which I already introduced. So video-based learning, I'm sure that all of you have used videos for learning. It's a very nice and easy way to learn something new. Uh, it's very popular with high generation. Uh, I guess some of you might not even be using books anymore. Our generation, we use books, but now it's all <coughs> digital. Um, now, video-based learning is being used in all kinds of instructional settings, ranging from pure online learning, distance learning. It, be, it can be used for informal learning, formal learning. It can be used, for example, in flipped classroom. Uh, lots of different kinds of things. Uh, now, in this particular project, we are interested in teaching soft skills. So, not discipline dependent skills, but skills such as collaboration, communication, negotiation, intercultural uh, uh, communication, and so on. Now, the problem is, if you use videos, uh, videos very often lead to passive learning. So, the learner can just watch the video and it's not engaged in any other way apart from watching the video. Uh, the basis for our project is this ICAP framework. Um, the ICAP framework was introduced relatively recently, you see here, Jean Valley wrote a paper about it in 2014. Uh, they are educational psychologists. So they looked at different modes of education and tried to classify different modes uh, regarding how active the learner is while they are you know, participating in lectures, watching videos, or whatever. And you can see that they have basically four different categories of learning. Uh, now, this classification into four categories was based on overt behaviors. When someone is learning, we don't really know what's going on in their head, obviously. So we can only observe the overt behaviors and then from there, from those observations, induce what kind of engagement, um, the, uh, what kind of behavior they display. So basically they're saying is if someone is learning in a passive way, uh, there are lots of different examples like listening to a talk, right? What you're doing right now. If you're not doing anything else, that's passive learning. So you're just receiving information. It could be in a um, lecture-based uh, situation or it could be just watching videos, for example. The second type, active learning. Uh, an example would be you go to a lecture, uh, you're listening to the lecture, but you're also taking notes. And these notes are basically what the lecture is saying. So you are active, but you're just recording what's going on. So that's active, uh, the active mode. Constructive mode is something more than the active mode. So for example, you go to a lecture, you listen to the lecture, you're taking notes, but you also maybe uh, modify that information that you have obtained from the lecture, maybe drawing a diagram or maybe making a hierarchy for yourself to be able to better understand what's going on. So basically the, uh, it, it includes more activity, not just reporting what's happening, but kind of making a summary, making maybe a concept map of the different concepts that have occurred and so on. Uh, so this generation aspect is important here. And then the interactive mode, an example would be if you're trying to teach someone else you're talking to a friend, you're learning the same uh, subject, but you're talking to them, you're discussing, you're exchanging ideas. 
So in this last month we had the dialogue between at least two learners, but it could be more than two. Okay. So they have looked at lots, lots of research that has been done in education. And they looked at the findings from the studies. And basically they found that the highest amount of learning is for learners who are in the interactive mode. And then uh, when you go to constructive, there is less learning, and then even less when you go to active. And the smallest amount of learning happens in the passive mode. Okay, so the, in that particular paper, there are lots of examples of different learning situations and how they are classified. But if we just look at learning from videos, it's mostly in this category because the learners are just watching, they're not doing much else. So, uh, in the last few years, there have been a lot of research papers about learning from videos, and they all of them uh, recognize this problem of passive learning if you're just watching videos. So there are different kinds of strategies that can be built around videos to increase the amount of engagement and learning. One of them is, for example, the teacher can play a video in a lecture, and then after the video is finished, they can uh, structure a discussion about that particular video. Right? Um, another the approach is to build quizzes and interactive activities directly into the video. And there are even software packages that allow you to do that. So you can take an existing video and add questions, multi-choice questions or something like that. So the learner would be watching a part of the video and then they get a question that they have to answer and then continue uh, watching the video. Now these approaches, there are other approaches as well. But what's important to notice here is that the teacher does not only take a video, the teacher has to um, provide additional effort in, in order to increase this amount of learning. And what we wanted to do is, first of all, we are not asking the teachers to create completely new videos because that's very expensive. We are also not asking the teacher to modify existing videos. We wanted to develop an approach which can, which can take existing videos, for example, from YouTube, and then provide an environment in which the students are going to be more engaged. So our approach basically includes interactive note-taking. So you will see um, a screenshot of the environment that we um, are using, but basically we started from the fact that students are already using uh, note-taking in lots of different environments. For example, in YouTube, you watch a video and you can post comments on it. Now, in, in order to increase the usefulness, or if you want, of making comments and videos, um, we came up with this idea of using aspects as reflective prompts. I'll show you how that works. So we have developed this uh, environment, which is still very, very simple. This is still like a prototype of the environment. We call it ABW space, which stands for Active Video Watching Space. It is a controlled video watching environment. So just to let you know how we see the whole thing happening, so the teacher can select existing videos from YouTube and include them in this environment. Um, basically, when the teacher does that, they will be looking at the particular content that they want to cover. And at the same time, we allow the teacher to specify the aspects. Those aspects, of course, have to be meaningful for that particular situation. Um, and I'll talk, tell you a little bit more about that. But basically there are two phases. There is the first phase, which is the personal phase, in which the student watches the video and comments on the video whenever they want. And then there is the second phase, which is the social phase. So after a certain period of time, it could be one week or two weeks, the teacher can open the comments to the whole class. And they're all anonymous, so there is no problem with you know, being afraid what other people are going to say about what you have written. But basically, students can rate comments by others. So let me show you how it works. This is a screenshot of the first phase, the personal phase. Uh, in this particular talk, I'm going to talk about uh, studies that we have done with presentation skills. There are lots of other um, skills that can be covered in this environment. It is completely general purpose. But we wanted to start with presentation skills because we have noticed that our students very often have problems presenting. And it's normal for everyone to be nervous when they are presenting. Right? Now, for presentation skills, 
the, the ideal way to learn them would be, first of all, to get some understanding of what good presentations are, and then to practice and get feedback from a teacher or someone else, and then practice again, right? So that kind of approach is possible probably on the PhD level when there are fewer students, but if you have a large class, it's not feasible, it's not scalable, so we can't do it. So that's why we wanted to look at presentation skills first. So what we have done, we selected eight, eight videos from uh, YouTube. They're all publicly available. The first four videos, this is tutorial. There are four tutorials and there are four examples. So we told our students to watch these tutorials first. And tutorials, they are, they are all very short videos. Um, I think the longest one is like eight minutes. So basically, these tutorials go over the basic techniques that should be used in presentations. Um, now, when, when the students are learning from these tutorials, we have defined the four aspects that you can see here. One of them is, I'm rather good at this. So for example, the student can notice that the presenter did something and they know that they have done it themselves, right? Um, the second one is, I did, so, I did or saw this in the past. The third one is, I didn't realize I wasn't doing this. So this particular aspect tells us that the student has noticed something completely new for them in this particular video. And the last, is, the last one is, I like this point, okay? So basically when we define the aspects, we wanted the aspects to serve as scaffolds for reflection. For teaching soft skills, any kind of soft skill, it's very important for the learner to contextualize their learning in their own experience. So to remember presentations they have done before, to compare what they have done with the particular video. And these aspects basically focus their attention on particular things. So when the student is watching the video, they can um, stop it at any time, they can enter the comment, and then they select uh, an aspect for that particular comment and submit it. And you can see all the previous comments on the right. Okay, so that's basically the, the private phase. So as I mentioned, there are four tutorials. We told students to watch them first. And after the tutorial, uh, we have four examples. And these are real students giving it presentations. So for the examples, we told them to try to critique them in terms of um, structure of the presentation, visual aids that we used, delivery and speech. So the first phase, if you want, is you know, watching tutorials, learning about how to give presentations, and then after that, critiquing presentations made by others. Now, after that, the teacher has um, the ability to open the comments to the class. We don't, we don't do it automatically because we just wanted the teacher to be able to see maybe there are some offending comments or whatever. Um, and once the comments are open to the class, this is what it looks. So the student still sees the video. Uh, there are all these comments and you can see the time in the video when the comment was made. If they click on one of these, they, uh, uh, they could see that particular part of the video automatically. So that they can re-watch that part of the video. So this one, for example, says, finish with a clear sum summary of what his re uh, this vision for the finish link nicely with his opening statement. And the aspect was speech. So this was about speech. Um, when the student wants to rate a comment, they have these three specified ratings. And again, the teacher can specify the rating categories they want. So in this particular case, um, one category is, this is useful for me. So this indicates learning. So they have learned something from someone else's comment on that video. Um, I hadn't thought of this. Again, this is a novel situation. Um, I didn't notice this, so they missed some point. And then the last two, I like this point or I don't agree. So this is like inducing opinions on comments made by others. So again, when we were specifying the ratings, we wanted to focus students on learning, on reflection. And the rating comments also enables them to see different points of view. So they watch the video, but maybe someone else noticed something that they haven't noticed. So another type of learning. 
Okay, so the studies that I'm going to talk about, they, uh, I'm going to mention three studies, we have done more, I mean, there's no time to go into all these details. In all these studies, we looked at presentation skills. The very first study was with postgraduate students, so uh, master students, PhD students. Um, we also had studies with undergraduate students at different levels. So I'm in the College of Engineering, and most of the studies were done in the College of Engineering, but we have also done one study in the School of Business with first-year students. So kind of looking at different types of, different populations of students. The materials were exactly the same, so we had the same four tutorials and four examples, and these are the aspects and the rating categories which I already discussed. Okay, so the research questions, why are we doing this? Um, first of all, we wanted to see whether if we support learning in this particular way, whether uh, the system, this, this particular platform supports learning. Can we see the difference with, before they use the platform and after they use the platform? Um, now, we expected that students are going to use the platform in different ways. And we wanted also to see if there are different kinds of behaviors in the platform, which behaviors are productive, which behaviors result in increased learning, okay? Now the second question was about this micro scaffold, so basically aspects and rating categories. We wanted to see if students use them, are they making better comments, are they, are they learning, in comparison to students who don't use the aspects. Uh, the third uh, question was about the different learning profiles. We wanted to see if there are different kinds of behaviors uh, to look at the features, the, you know, the, the strengths and weaknesses of those particular students and find the differences between them. Um, and then finally, what is the learning experience? So we wanted to see their subjective opinions, whether they enjoyed this experience, whether they have some comments about how to improve, and so on. Okay, so I'm going to spend most of the time talking about two studies, but I'll mention at the end another study. Uh, they were all slightly different, not only because of the types of students we had, but also because we changed a little bit different elements of the, of the environment itself. Um, so the very first study was with postgraduate students. And in this study, that was the very first one, so we wanted to see is there any learning happening or not. So that was our goal for that study. You can see that there was only one group in this study. In the first phase, uh, they watched the videos. In the second phase, they commented, uh, rated, uh, rated comments written by others, and that was it. The second study was designed differently. So in the second study, we had two groups. We had the experimental group and we had the control group. The difference between these two groups was that the control group didn't have any aspects. They could watch the videos, they could write comments, but they didn't have aspects at all. Um, now, in the second phase, only the experimental group rated comments. The control group only watched videos, and that was the end for them. In all cases, at the beginning, we had a survey, and this survey consisted of quite a lot of questions, including some demographic questions like, what is their primary language, uh, what they are studying, that kind of stuff. Then also, we had questions about their, their knowledge of presentation skills, and I'll go deeper into that in a minute. Then the second survey was in the middle, between the private and social phase. And here we again used to ask them about conceptual knowledge, but we also asked them um, whether the commenting interface was usable, whether they had to, uh, in, you know, uh, that it was very, a lot of effort that was needed, what was demanding, that kind of stuff. And then at the end of the social phase, we had survey three, which had, again, knowledge, uh, conceptual knowledge questions, and also questions on usability and cognitive load for the social interface. Okay, so we collected a lot of data, and data of different types, different natures. Some uh, data was structured, some was unstructured, because they were open-ended questions, they could write whatever they wanted. Now, to just go a little bit deeper into the first survey, as I said, we had the demographic data. 
Then after that, we used uh, these motivated strategies for learning questionnaire, which was developed by psychologists, educational psychologists. And this uh, questionnaire contains quite a lot of questions. We only used 46 questions, uh, because the rest of them cover situations when you are taking tests, and that was not applicable to our situation. So the questions are about motivation for learning, strategies for learning, how they organize learning, whether the learner feels in control of their own learning, and that kind of stuff. Uh, then we have conceptual knowledge uh, questions, and they were repeated in all three surveys. We had action plans, and then these two instruments, which are well uh, widely used instruments about usefulness and about cognitive ability. So this is the data that came from surveys. In addition, we also had data that was collected by the platform itself. So whenever the user performs an action in the platform, that's stored in the log. So we know whether they watch videos, whether they watch the whole video or just a part of it. Um, we know which comments they made and when exactly they made them and how many ratings they made as well. Now the conceptual knowledge questions. Um, as I said earlier, the best way to teach presentation skills would be to actually have someone give a presentation and give them feedback. But we cannot do that in a computer-based system. So instead, what we have done is we asked them three questions. We gave them one minute per question. So the question was like, write everything you know about the structure. And they have one minute. So they can write words, phrases, sentences, whatever they wanted. It was free input. So one was about structures, one about uh, delivery and speech during presentation, and one was about visual aids, any kind of visual aids. Uh, now, in order to be able to mark these questions, what we have done is we developed a taxonomy. And this taxonomy, there are three taxonomies, one for structure, one for delivery and speech, and one for video aids. I don't have time to tell you exactly how we have done it. Um, and then basically we manually marked all the replies to our surveys. There were three of us who marked, and then we checked whether we agree. For study one, the agreement was almost 90%. For study two, it was slightly over 90%. Okay? So it means in 90% of the situations, we agreed on how we marked the questions. And then in the cases we, we disagreed, uh, we did majority vote, or in some cases, we remarked those questions. Okay, so the very first study, as I said, was with postgraduate students. Uh, they were all volunteers, so we asked students whether they wanted to participate in the study. And 48 postgraduate students uh, agreed to participate. However, not all of them completed all the phases of the study. So. Um, but in this talk, I'm going to talk about 38 students who completed all the, study, all the surveys and commented on videos. The second study was with undergraduate engineering students. They were in their third year from two different courses. Um, and in this particular case, we divided them into control and experimental group randomly. Um, Remember, the difference was that the control group didn't have aspects, and the experimental group had a full version of the platform. Um, there were similar structures, similar age, because this is engineering. We mostly have boys, very few girls. Um, but they were, you know, taking the same courses, basically. Now, in study two, um, we divided them into three categories. So this is coming back to, to the ICAT framework that I mentioned earlier. So students, there were some students who never logged on to the platform. They filled the survey, but they never logged on to it. They never watched any videos. And we categorized them as inactive students. Then we had some students who logged on to the platform. They watched some videos. Some of them manipulated the video. That's basically fast forwarding or rewinding, but they haven't written any comments. And from our point of view, basically, these are passive or active learners, but they're not constructive. They haven't really um, generated something new on top of what was happening in the video. And then the third group is constructive learners. These are people who have actually written comments. 
okay? And you can see this is um, the number of students who have uh, done different parts of the study. Uh, 11 from out of 18 in the control group logged on, uh, 13 out of 19 the mental group, and only six from each group uh, have written comments, some have written survey two, and some also survey three. Okay, so back to my first question. Does this particular platform support learning or not? And to answer that question, we looked at the conceptual knowledge scores. How much they have written about the three questions. Um, so in this table, this first column is about everyone. So these are postgraduate students. The second column is constructive learners from study two undergraduate students. The third column, again, undergraduate students, but those who were passive, they just watched videos. And then in the last column, we had inactive learners. They fill the survey when they have to watch videos. Okay. So you can see, basically, if you look at postgraduate students, uh, their score on survey one was 12.89, and it decreased for survey two, and then further increased for survey three. And this because increase was significant, so um, they, they increased their knowledge of presentation skills by watching videos. Uh, the same happened for the constructive learners from study two as well, so their score went up. But if you look at the passive learners, their score actually, their score on survey three is lower than their score on the previous two surveys, so they, they, they have to learn actual knowledge. And for inactive students, so basically, from, from this analysis, we can say that only constructive learning uh, leads to increased knowledge of presentation skills. But this is just conceptual knowledge of presentation skills. OK, so only constructive behavior led to increased learning. And um, we use these two studies to basically formulate requirements for future work on the environment. So what can be else, what can be uh, basically enhanced in the environment to increase learning? The first um, requirement was to enhance the learning, both the personal space and the social space, with intelligent support to foster constructive behavior. Um, basically, this can be done in many different ways. I will tell you some of the ways at the end. But it can be, uh, for example, you notice that the student is watching the video and hasn't made any comments. So we can give them some feedback, some encouragement to write comments, and hopefully they will change their behavior. The second question was about uh, micro scaffolds, the aspects in the ratings. We wanted to see whether that makes a difference. And in the second study, if you remember, uh, the difference between the control group and the experimental group was that only experimental group had aspects. So we compared the results. In study one, that was the bigger study, there were 790 comments written by all students together. In study two, we had 239 comments. But if you look just at constructive learners from the two studies, uh, they made approximately the same number of comments. There was no significant difference between the number of comments. Uh, now, this table has lots of numbers, but I'll just let you know briefly what this is about. So we looked at all the videos. You can see the length. So the longest video was 8.3. Minutes. Um, and you can see the number of comments that they have written on, on these different videos. Uh, there is a slightly higher number of comments on tutorials in comparison to examples. And basically, in the open ended questions, you said that they liked watching tutorials because they were learning new stuff. Um, and they have written more comments. Very few comments were not rated. So once when we opened them for rating, um, they were ratings for everything. And if you look at the number of ratings, there were 2.7 2 thousand ratings um, on comments altogether. They use different aspects. So here, uh, on this side, we have study one. In study one, students did not have to use aspects. So they could write a comment and not specify an aspect for it. And if you look at the pie charts, this is the area for no aspect. So a lot of the time, they were not specifying aspects. Um, this is 
the, the, the aspect is used for the examples. So again, this light rule is when they have not very specified examples. We started to be forced them to use aspects, so they could not submit a comment without the aspect. And there is a more even distribution of, of different aspects. Now, if you look at the ratings, what happened with the ratings? Um, there are five different categories for ratings. And basically, we group these three as rating categories that show that there was learning during the social phase. And the other two, uh, basically, these are ratings that uh, induce opinion. And you can see the number of ratings for study one and also for study two. Now, what was interesting in study two is that there were two students who jointly provided 150 ratings, which, which is the majority of all the ratings here. So we wanted to see whether these micro scaffolds help. Are students who are using aspects learning more than students who don't use aspects? Um, and basically, in study two, we had those two groups, control and experimental, so we can compare them. So you can see, for example, uh, conceptual knowledge scores for the control group and for the experimental group. Now, when we, uh, because the study was small, there were only five students in each of these two groups. Uh, so the control group did not improve significantly between the two surveys. They pretty much stayed at the same level. But for the experimental group, we had significant improvement. So basically, this is the proof that students do learn more when they're focusing on particular aspects uh, that we use. For passive and active learners, there were very, very few of them, so we can do any statistical tests. So the finding was that aspects uh, do result in uh, higher learning. And the recommendation for the future use of the platform coming from this result is that we should always use aspects. So in the later studies, we always use aspects for, for all the students. We also decided that it is uh, put into an intelligent support to encourage ratings. So if we have students who are watching uh, other comments but they are not rating them, maybe give them advice that rating is good for learning, that kind of advice. And then the, the next uh, requirement is to basically introduce a learner profile where we are going to capture the history and the behavior of each individual learner and we can provide them feedback on the basis of the learner profile. So when I mention the learner profile, I'm not going to go over all these numbers, there are lots of them, but this is basically what we get from this motivated strat strategies for learning questionnaire. So as I said, there are 46 questions and we summarize them into 10 different dimensions, uh, which are mentioned here. The top few rows are basically, um, they are replies to uh, demographic questions and other questions related to how they use YouTube. So if you look at the first one, this was about how much training they have had, formal training on presentation skills. And there was no difference between the various categories of learning. The second one is about how much experience they had. And the postgraduate students had more experience in comparison to undergraduate students, which is not surprising, right? <laughs> then another question is about how much they use YouTube. And we again found a significant difference between postgraduates and undergraduates, with postgraduates are using YouTube significantly less than undergraduates, and that's just the, you know, different, different generations of students. Now, these rows from past values, self-efficacy, economic control, motivation, effort regulation, rehearsal, organization, elaboration, self-regulation, these are the motivated strategies for learning. So you can see significant differences in the case of past value, also in the case of effort regulation, organizational operation and self-regulation. And basically, postgraduate students have higher scores. And that's because they, they have more experience, they have, they have had more education over time. So, first of all, what we found from this is that more experienced students are more likely to uh, engage in constructive learning. Um, 
basically this means that we should include information about how much experience and how much training they had in the learning profile and use that for further um, interventions. Now, when it comes to intelligence support, because there are different profiles of students, different kinds of behaviors, then they should get different kind of um, support as well. For constructive learners, we want to encourage them to reflect on their past experience because they have more experience. For passive uh, learners, we want to encourage elaboration, self-regulation, organization, and also the value of engaging in constructive learning as well. So the recommendation is to look at what kind of personalized strategies can support learning in this environment. Um, now this table provides some results about the, the experience when using ABW space. And you can see the results for the personal space and social space separately. So we asked them about how much, uh, how demanding it was to comment on videos, or how demanding it was to rate comments. We asked them how much effort they had to invest, uh, whether they were frustrated or not. Uh, and also we asked them whether they think they were, uh, their performance was good when they were commenting or whether they were rating. Now this last one is a summary of their replies on the usefulness, how useful uh, commenting is in this case, and how useful it is to rate comments rated by others. So we found some significant differences. Uh, for example, there's a significant difference between uh, for frustration between commenting and rating comments for postgraduates. Postgraduates um, really didn't like uh, the social space very much. They said there was a lot of comments to rate. Remember, there was 700 something comments, so they had to look at a lot of text. And they said many of the comments are very similar, so they didn't like that. Uh, uh, and also, when we look at the usefulness for the personal space, there was a significant difference between postgraduate students and undergraduate students. Uh, with undergraduate students, saying that it was more useful um, in comparison to the postgraduate students. These are the questions we have, so I'm just going to skip that. Okay, so basically students said that it was demanding to watch videos and comment on them, and this is the quote from one student who said, I needed to pay proper attention and what was explained to recall my experience and perceive the usefulness of the tricks and techniques told by the presenter. So from here you see that the student reflected on their own experience while they were watching the video, which is exactly what we wanted. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a significant difference on usefulness of commenting uh, with undergraduates finding it more useful than postgraduates. And then also, rating was more frustrating uh, for commenting, and I also found a uh, lower performance in that. Uh, there were 20% of students who didn't find rating useful, and the reasons they stated, as I said, lots of comments to read, not all comments are of good quality, many similar, and there was no structure. So, from this, we learned that we had to provide more structure for rating. So they could be done, maybe you have all comments that uh, discuss the same type of concept together or uh, structuring in any kind of way. So basically providing different sorting mechanisms for comments. Um, here there are a few things they said about different types of questions. For example, for mental demand, it is easy to watch a video, but it is actually harder, challenge, more challenging to find the important bits. For mental demand, I found trying to watch the videos and take notes on them at the same time, uh, thinking of how it relates to my previous experience, how it can uh, improve my future presentations to be rather demanding. So basically, this shows how much they, they have been engaged while they watch the videos. Uh, what is most exciting, being more active and perceptive, 
uh, effort trying to create relevant comments as well. Okay, so that's basically a discussion about what happens with different categories of learn learners, but we also wanted to see if we just look at constructive learners, is the difference between them? And this graph here, this is from study one, so these are postgraduate students, all of them commented on the videos. And we used K-means clustering to see whether we can identify subgroups of students that have some common features. So you see three clusters here. But the values that these different bars basically represent values from the MSLQ questionnaire. So we label them just to be able to, to discuss them better. If you look at this cluster here, they have a lot of experience. They don't use YouTube for learning very much. Okay? They have relatively good metacognitive and self-regulation skills. Um, so this is our ideal cluster. We call it self-regulated learners. This cluster here is lowest on every, everything. So they have very little experience. Uh, they don't use YouTube for learning very much. They have low self-efficacy, low motivation, and so on. Okay. We call it parochial learners. And this cluster here, these are people who have very good learning strategies. But if you look at this bar here, the gray bar, that is the, where is it? Uh, that is, that was conceptual knowledge, it's not shown appropriately here. That is conceptual knowledge, so they don't know much about presentation skills, okay? So this uh, clustering was only based on the input data, what we had before they started using the um, platforms. When we looked at how they behaved, we found out that these people here, they make the highest number of comments and the highest quality comments as well. The parochial learners, cluster one, they made a relatively high number of comments, but they were not very good. They were talking about some things which are not of crucial value. While this group here, they made very, very few comments. So they watched the videos, they wrote some comments, but not as many as the other two partners. And we call them habitual video watchers. So they are used to a passive mode of watching videos. We found lots of significant differences. I'm going to skip that because that's a lot of numbers. But then we also looked at what kind of vocabulary they use in their comments. So this is text mining, text analytics. And we have found significant differences between three different clusters. If you look at what are the terms that they commonly use in comments. So for parochial learners, this is what we identified. For habitual, there are only two concepts that all of them used, which is presentation and pen, nothing else. While for the best group, there are lots of different concepts, and they're important concepts for this particular one. Um, domain, so presentation, slides, story, line, beginning, and interest, and so on and so on. Just to show you another presentation, so this is text network analysis, another type of learning analytics. So on this graph, the nodes represent different learners. So this is one learner, this is another learner, another one. And then you see the different concepts they use in their comments. So there is some um, Commonalities. There are some concepts that more than one learner used, but not as much as in this this one. This is the best cluster. Okay, so they are all talking about important things in videos, and that's why we have so many links between them. So basically, what we want to do now is to add intelligence to the platform, so that we move all the students to this cluster. Okay. And for that, we're going to use the choice architecture. If you haven't heard about this, I strongly recommend to read this book. Uh, it's called Nudge. It's very easy to, to read. It's not a scientific book. Now, it is written by um, Richard Thaler. And Richard Thaler this year got the Nobel Prize for Economics because of this work. Okay? So what he talks about in this uh, book is 
Um, there, there are lots of situations where people need to make choice. And people do not behave logically. Most of us, for one reason or the other, will make decisions which are, which are not logical, right? Um, so basically, they go over lots of examples going from how we choose food in the restaurants, how we select health insurance plans or retirement plans, or lots of different kinds of situations, showing that people make suboptimal decisions. So this choice and detection, this is about how do we help people make better decisions, but at the same time, not forcing them to make a particular decision, giving them choice, and not limiting the freedom of choice, okay? So the approach they use, they call it libertarian paternalism. So you still have choice, but you are kind of, you have more information about how to make a good choice, okay? So we are not restricting freedom, but we are nudging, that's why it's called nudge. We are nudging the user towards making good decisions. And these good decisions are not based on what's good for the company, but what is good socially, okay? Looking at common good. So the principles is basically people have capability when they are making a choice, they have certain capability. They have motivation and they have opportunity. So we want to maximize the capability to, to know what decision is a good decision, okay? We want to increase the motivation to engage in good behaviors and decrease motivation to in, uh, engage in suboptimal behaviors. And we want to maximize the opportunity for self-regulation, to basically teach them how to be better learners or better decision makers. Now, what does that mean in our particular situation? So the capability, basically, knowing what the user comes in with. What are their strengths, what are their learning strategy, what are their self-regulation strategies, that kind of stuff. Motivation, we want to increase motivation to learn constructively and decrease motivation to learn passively. And the opportunity, how do we support them in making good choices, okay? So basically, what we decided to do, and that's what we are currently doing, is to add the profile of the learner, the model of the learner. So we are going to collect information about what they do, also information from Survey 1, and that's going to be in the student model. And then provide three different types of nudges. Okay, the first one is decision information nudges. So before they start watching the video, we are going to tell them, in previous studies we have seen that students who write comments learn more. Okay, so we are telling them what is good for them. If they don't want to do it, they still have the opportunity to just watch passively, but they have more information about it. We are also going to give them visualizations of what other students have done and visualization of their own behavior so they can do social comparison with the other people. Now, information about decision structure, uh, I'll show an example. So this is a visualization which shows how three different clusters of users comment on a particular video. So every dot is one comment, okay? So you see that this cluster, that is our uh, habitual cluster, they make very few comments compared to this cluster. So if you have someone who is in this cluster, you might want to show them this and say, see what kind of comments people have made and at which parts of the video they commented. So that might motivate them to make better comments. And we also may show them a few examples of very good comments. Um, and then also decision assistance. So when they make a comment, a, a good comment, we'll give them positive feedback, say this is a very high quality comment. Basically that will be based on text analytics again. Or if they uh, make a negative uh, you know, a comment which is of low quality, we are not going to tell them this is a bad comment, that's not good, but we are going to give them examples of better comments and uh, say something like, see what other people have said about this part. So some examples, uh, can you relate this to your past ex experience? You might find this useful, have you thought about a particular comment? Um, I'm going to skip this. 
We just want to, show, uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, the latest study which we have just finished. I'm still analyzing the data. So this was done in Engineering 101. This is the biggest course at our university. So basically every engineering student has to do this course. This year we had 904 students and we invited them to use this. Uh, about half of them completed survey one. And then we divided these people into three categories. So you see 160 inactive students, 153 passive, and 150 constructive. So the constructive students wrote more than a thousand comments. Uh, the mean was 7.94, but the range was quite big. Some of them only wrote one comment, and there were some who wrote 75. Now, in this course, every student has to give presentation. They have a group project. That group project is, um, some of you might have heard about Engineers Without Borders. That is a society, and every, uh, every year they issue a challenge, and students around the world will do this challenge, okay? So at the end of the course, they have to give a presentation, and this presentation is marked by human tutors. So we analyze then the marks, the actual presentation marks. And this is what happened. Uh, so we compared the results from 2016, marks from 2016, last year, and marks from this class. The only difference is AVW space. Everything else was the same. And we found a significant difference between these two classes with the effect size of 0.44. So this is basically how much they have increased. So that's almost half of the grade increase. Now in 2017, we also, because we classified them into three groups, we looked at whether there is difference between constructive, active, uh, constructive, passive, and inactive. And there was a significant difference. And you see the actual marks. So constructive students got higher marks than the other two categories. Okay, so what we are doing now, is basically we are working on enhancing the environment, providing this intelligence support that we mentioned. Um, we are developing interactive visualizations to be added to the system and also personal technologies. And then later we are going to, to work on other soft skills. So as I said, the platform is completely general purpose. It can be used for anything. Um, this focus on soft skills is just because we have uh, noticed that students lack this you know, the, in this particular area. Okay, so that's my presentation. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.
today. We have seen a significant difference in how much training they had in presentation skills and also how much experience they had. Everything else was the same, but those two variables were different. Yes, there's a lot to be said about cultural difference in background systems. Yes. Anybody else? Um, I mean, we are we are two different people here: students yes. and teachers. Yes. Okay. Um, so it's not to the section presentation mm -hmm. and just summarize. Mm -hmm. As a teacher, yeah. what is the best mode or the best way to uh, transmit messages or give teaching to students? Really give them. Mm -hmm. And for students, what's the best mode to absorb the most? Okay, so what is the best, best mode of teaching you know, in any kind of situation we are not just talking about this particular environment? Yes. The best is one-on-one, -on -one, but of course we cannot afford that. Yeah. Yeah. Now in a class, um, uh, we have looked at lots of literature, especially about video-based learning. And we found that um, short videos are much better. Uh, and some studies show basically that the ideal length is between six and eight minutes, not longer than that. Also, um, when it, you know, if you look at the style of video, what kind of video it is, uh, talking head, you know, some, seeing someone's face seems to be much more effective than was showing, for example, lecture slides and voiceover. Um, but interactive events. Most engaging. So in this particular part, we are trying to engage them by commenting and rating process. Um, there are also lots of other ways, but um, it depends on the domain. Okay? So in my other work, I work on intelligent tutoring systems, where the students have to learn how to solve problems, and we give them lots of feedback along the way. But for soft skills, that approach doesn't work. So, one more question. Yeah. This you're talking about students that are in front of you. What about distance learning? This is all online. online. This is all online. Yes. Uh, there, there is no face to face. Yes. Is that good teaching skills or something like this? It depends. Yes. In my university, for example, uh, we have a list of graduate attributes. So how we see a student when the student finishes their studies. And there are five attributes. One of them is about the domain. So being a good chemist or being a good biologist or whatever. You know, but the other four are about soft skills. Well, it's lots of short videos, not just one. Yeah? So basically, each video focuses on one particular concept. It covers the rest of the videos. Well, we still have to do more data mining. We haven't finished. Especially with this large group where we had 400 something students. We want to see whether we're going to see the same clusters as in post gradients or not. And then develop intelligent nudges that would work for these different groups of students. You say there's two kinds of videos, the tutorial and example. Yeah, that's how we classify them. Yeah. Why is there no mix between tutorial and example? That's only our classification, just to make it easier for students. So they know that the first group is teaching them something, and for the second group, they have to be basically judges. Do you have about Linda.com? The website, Linda.com? No. They have a mix of the I mean, the example of tutorial that they send to you. So yeah. they divide it into small video, yes. Yeah. But the video they have everything. Like, if you want to create anything, like language, any language you want to understand how to do it, and start programming things, yeah. they will start telling you simple, uh, for every step you provide it. They teach you everything. Mm. After that, they give you two examples. And after that, they cut the end with the video. Yeah. They will give you a question later. You need to answer yeah. so you can go to the next. Yeah, that can be done for normal domains. It's much more difficult for sorts of
transcript, but your soft skills. In which case, presentation skills really carry the weight, not just for you to gain the, get the job during the interview, but as your career progresses. It is something, if those of you have been fortunate or, or unfortunate to be part of my class, you will know, right? Yeah. yeah it's already a compulsory thing. Okay? Yes. So, yes, thank you very much for spending your time with us and thanks again to Prof. Tanya. Okay. And you can ask a question, anything about the university or about the work that they do, just to know more about that after this. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.